This is SciBite, episode 121 for February 25th, 2014. And welcome to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast, live on a Tuesday and fresh on a Wednesday over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. So what are we going to talk about today? Today, we're going to take a look at cell-based cancer therapy, growing lungs, radiation freight MRIs, 3D Kime Scene Scanners, Spacecraft Updates, Curiosity News, and as always, take a peek back in history and up in the sky this week. All right, Heather, well, why don't I initiate the science by pressing the news button? Okay, what are we going to cover in the news today? All right, there's been the largest clinical study ever conducted up to date with patients of a specific uh, advanced leukemia that had 88% of the people achieving complete remission after being treated. Wow. This is another one of those immunotherapy things where it's they take your own immune cells, uh, tweak them, and then give them back to you. Because in this specific case, it was adult B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, Hmm. E-all, which essentially means um, what's happening is the immune system isn't able to identify that those cells are bad. So if scientists are able to take a bunch of uh, white blood cells out, teach them that the cancer cells are bad, and then it re-inject them into the person. Wow. So that their immune system starts to actually recognize that those are foreign, they need to be eradicated. They've been tweaking with ideas about various, um, you know, diseases and things, about what to use this with. Actually, in 2003, they were actually able to, uh, that's when they were first able to tweak the T cells uh, immune system in order to recognize a specific protein Mm -hmm. found in those cancer cells. Mm. So that's like, okay, well now we can identify, we can teach the immune immune system how to identify that specific protein. So identify specific cells so they can see them. Then in March of last year, they're able to use it for five different patients you know, and all of them were able to complete, you know, able to achieve complete remission. Wow. Now, this latest study actually a little over tripled that. 16 patients were all given their own, you know, genetically modified immune cells back. And actually, one of the first people, it kind of takes a long time for this to kind of catch up. But he's able to undergo a bone marrow transplant, but cancer-free, you know, back at work. Um, so generally with this is you get it knocked down and then you have a bone marrow transplant Mm -hmm. because this is a cancer of the blood and, uh, the bone marrow is where it's kind of the beginning of the factory for blood. So you have to kick out all the cancer cells. Then you get new bone marrow into someone so that then the new bone marrow is actually able to create good blood cells. So you kind of a twofold process. And what this uh, is let, allowing to do is saying, okay, well, this is one of those cancers where if you fail the first time around, if it actually relapse and comes back, it is very, very hard to treat again with uh, chemotherapy. So it's getting past, it's reducing the numbers of that and being able to get more people into uh, the ability to have a bone marrow transplant. And they're able to, of the 16 people who were able to follow the treatment, um, seven of them were able to actually undergo bone marrow transplants and move forward. Mm. And then from there, there were you know some ineligible for this or for that, declined the treatment. But the numbers are actually much better than you know normal without the specific immunotherapy treatment. Mm. And so now they're kind of going along. They're like, okay, well, now let's see, there's some side effects to it, you know, kind of flu-like symptoms type thing. So how to manage that, how to d- 
develop criteria and lab tests that can say, okay, well, which patients might be at greater risk for, um, you know, side effects or who might be better, who it might help better. Yeah. And of course, there's going to be a lot of additional, you know, studies to determine, you know, how well this is works for this. And, oh, can you actually use it for other cancers that are, you know, how can you use this knowledge here used into other cancer studies that are also going on of this nature. Wow. Uh, so where do, where does it go now? Cause this seems pretty significant. Yeah. Well, essentially with these type of things, it, it grows. I mean, you know, first in 2003, they had you no, know, Hey, we can identify. Then last March they had five people. Now they have 16 people. Essentially it steps up. Okay. You go through and you say, all right, this is what happens with this group of people. Make sure all the ducks are in a line. Everything's been, you know, looked at as best you can. Then step it up to a larger group of people. And so then you can see, because if, so maybe you have, you know, some allergic reaction in 1% of the population. If you have 10 people, you might not catch that. You might not catch that 1%. Yeah. If you have 50, then you're more likely to. But if you have 100, you're very likely to. So right. it's step the... You know, stepping the growth, the, the, a number of people up a bit at a time. So you can say, all right, well, here's everything we've learned here. Let's move it to the next group. Oh, now we can learn this and that. Hmm. And it's for things like this where it's very aggressive cancers. Then they have a little bit of wiggle room for how fast you can be able to move something forward generally. It's pretty amazing, and it sounds like it's it's uh, part of that. You know, using using uh, someone's own uh, blood to yeah. make this work is obviously a key part in its success. Uh, so, uh, I just, I just I'm just sort of really a kind of this is really kind of to me sounded like a a pretty major breakthrough. So I, I'm really excited about this. Oh yeah, I mean, when it was five people, it was I was very you know I was reading that I was like, wow, that's impressed. But yeah, with good. sixteen, yeah, it's getting even better, looking like they're being able to move forward and continue to move forward in a positive way. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Heather has all the like the, the nitty gritty numbers in the show notes too. If if uh, you want if you didn't catch any of that, you can go catch uh, go read that and get all those details. Is there any thoughts on that one, Heather? Yeah, I know not yet. All right. Well keep us posted, would you? Cause Most I, definitely. Okay. All right. Well then why don't we take a quick break and just give a mention to the limited time Linux Action Show 300 t-shirt, which we still have up for sale. We've just reached 693 sales towards our goal of 754. Uh, and uh, every uh, last shirt, we also have a hoodie. We have a uh, long sleeve. We have a really nice looking long sleeve. And we also have a ladies uh, shirt, which uh, is also looks really good. And every shirt comes with a... That's right. It comes with a, with its own coin. Uh, and uh, it's we just got our first print coin. You can hear. Like, I'm playing with it right now. It's so awesome. Yeah, it's a coin right there. Yeah, that's not even your soundboard. It's kind of loud, isn't it? I'm sorry, but it's a coin. It's really neat. Now each shirt will be coming with a coin, and uh, they're turning out great. We just got our uh, our first uh, proof edition today, and I'm really I'm I, I'm like I now I want to get more shirts because it's like now I can get more coins. Uh, so you can go to teespringcom slash last 300 You can get a long sleeve, a t-shirt, a ladies tee, or a hoodie. It's got our brand new Linux Action Show logo that we finally got made after 300 episodes. And each shirt will come with a Linux Action Show limited edition challenge coin. So it's pretty cool. So go to uh, teespring.com slash last 300. Get yourself a shirt, uh, maybe a couple of shirts if you want a couple of coins because each one's coming with a coin. I'm really super excited about it. Teespring.com slash last 300. We also have a link in the sidebar over on the Jupiter Broadcasting website. But Heather, with all that done, I think that means it's time for the news bite. Okay, what are we talking about in the news bite? This is a story that sounds awesome, and the video is pretty awesome, and then it kind of freaks you out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I just read the headline. <laughs> the researchers have actually, for the first time, successfully grown a human lung in a lab. Wow. I've so seen an not, ear. I've seen that. So this is a lung. Yeah, we've seen lungs. We have actually have windpipes that have actually been implanted into humans but just uh, last spring. And there's a team in Boston who's actually implanted little grown ki kidneys into rats. So they're looking at that. Now, this isn't quite as, you know, self-building as you might think. What they did is they had two sets of lungs. Um, 
uh, from deceased juveniles, where one lung, they stripped all the living cells out. So it's a scaffold of elastin and collagen, you know, like the stuff your ear is made of as I'm wiggling my ear and no one can see it. Right. <laughs> um, and then healthy cells from the second lung were applied to that scaffolding ah. and then take put in a gas glass tank full of nutrient rich solution where all Star Wars geeks think it's a back to tank <laughs> and it's soaked for four weeks. And at that during that time, the new cells actually started growing and filling that scaffolding into a into the new lung, sort of resulting in that. And they did the, the whole process and a whole other set of lungs found the same thing that happened. So they don't know how well the lung would work if it were implanted into a person, if necessarily at all. Right. But they're definitely on the right track here. I guess it's pretty so, hard to test a lung. I mean, you can fill it up with air and see what it does, but... Yeah, which is you can see in the videos, they actually kind of pump the lung yeah, up and yeah, down. Yeah. Totally different feeling from seeing the image. Yeah. Like I saw the image and then I saw the little lung. When you see the video, it's like, oh, okay, all right. I mean, it looks like it's functional. Yeah. So the next part is they're actually going to sort of lab grow some and put them. I mean, they won't be in humans for at least a dozen years or so. But the next step is with pig lungs and planting them into live pig and see oh. how well they work. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I bet. I could see that. Oh, boy, there's there's the shot right there. Oh, that is something else. That is just amazing. And it's interesting, they, you, you know, the term, first of all, they call it kind of a scaffolding. And yeah. again, they're taking known good cells from one from one lung, right? And they're putting it on that mm -hmm. scaffolding. I think that's yeah, pretty so, interesting. Yeah, and then that the cells were able to kind of go throughout that scaffolding and build itself back up. Yeah. Um, amazing. And uh, it shows you maybe we'll live in a future where uh, almost any body part, even one as complex as the lungs, uh, can be regrown and replaced. And wouldn't that be interesting, the, the ramifications of that for people who uh, get lung cancer or people who've smoked uh, chronically for their entire lives and maybe have gotten lung damage? I mean, there's if you get to a point there's where you can a lot grow of different it, lung diseases. Yeah. I mean, the, it, you, we could see uh, a, a massive... Um, boon to, to lung health, I guess. It's pretty, yeah. it's pretty amazing. Wow, Heather. Well, any other thoughts on that one? Not that I could think of yet. All right, well, let me bring in the band. Hey, guys, come on in here. Let's do the two mic. Yeah, oh, God. Hey, All right, Heather, what are we talking about in the two bite news? All right, researchers have actually discovered an MRI based imaging techno technique that could be as effective as other scanning methods without using radiation. Oh, good. So this is especially interesting for um, uh, juvenile cancer detection. They're, they're getting a lot of MRI scans, kind of checking out what's going on. And if you could reduce the radiation levels there, it'd be really great. So they've actually, you know, seen that you know, they have radioactive traces that they send in through part of your body for a PET scan or an e MRI scan, and that essentially exposes you to about 700 chest X-rays. I've been there many times. They give you the little, or a number of times, they give you the little drip where it gives you little radi radioactive stuff, little traces. And then, of course, in pediatric payment, patients, very risky, could you know lead to secondary forms of cancer later in life. But they can... What well, they've st had a study composed of 22 children where it was actually shown that they could do this safely and effectively be able to mimic that re re with an iron supplement. Oh. They've actually shown before that iron supplements can increase the visibility on traditional MRIs with uh -huh. no adverse effects huh. or reactions. So now they're looking at it like, okay, well, if we tweak the system just a little bit, you can run it off of the iron supplement Entirely. only. Wow. So, of course, they're going to be, you know, stepping it up to larger groups of patients to make sure it actually, yeah. you know, to confirm the validity of it. But this what looked very exciting to me is that how to do this without the additional radiation. Yeah. And I wonder, too, uh, like if this could be eventually lead to the kind of evolution of our technology where 50 or 100 years, people will look back and kind of go like, I can't believe they did that. I can't believe they they injected that into the body and then and then they scanned it like that. Like it, it might be one of those things where 
it might just sort of make how we do it today look really antiquated. Well, sometimes medical does that. I mean, if you look back 50 years and you go, mm-hmm. wow, that's what we had. Mm-hmm. And now look 50 years in the future and say, wow, I hope we're that much farther along. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, speaking of kind of taking a leap ahead, uh, it sounds like there could be something almost like a tricorder in the works for, say, maybe police or crime enforcers. What's going on yes. here? Yes. Police in Queensland, Australia have reported they are now using and have had a handheld tricorder. Kind of. <laughs> it it's a little lidar device that they can walk around a crime scene and just within minutes they can get a recreation, a three D image of the crime scene itself. That's amazing. And then they bring this into the computer and they have essentially a three D representation of the entire scene. Yes. So lidar is what they use. Um, geologists use it. You can use it for, you know, NASA use it is where you send out a laser beam and then take a reading based off on what's ba- coming back to you. So it takes so long to get back. Then, you, you know, the speed of light, you know, how long it took to get back. You can start making a, a picture of what's going on. Now, this is actually based upon technology that's been used a number of times in the last several years. What this specific one does is that it, it it's a has 2D imaging, essentially. And they affix it to a top of a little spring that's like, you're holding it and it's like swinging around. And yeah, it does look a little 270 silly. 270 degree. Yeah. It almost looks silly, but there is method to the madness. Right. So the way it's spinning, it's able to sort of take that 2D image of every location, sort of spin it into 3D. And so nice. then a computer can connect all those together, make a fairly good 3D image of what's going on. It is kind of incredible. And uh, uh, Google's working on something kind of like this too called um, Tango. But it's I don't know if they're using LiDAR. This is this is something else all entirely. And, yeah. you know, right now it looks really goofy because the guy has to walk around while it's flipping back and forth. But they could automate that. They could put it in like something. You know, this is generation one technology we're looking at here. Yeah, they there are other you, there are. This isn't the first type of this technology being used. It's uh Police in New Mexico actually have what they call the Ferro 3D scanner system, which they use for they can use for like crime scenes or some. I mean, uh, car accidents huh. where it's you know a system has uh, the scene has to be cleared out in a certain amount of time. You know, you have to remove the cars, you have to clean up everything so yeah. the road can be in can use. In that case, it's a couple of stationary cameras that scan the scan the scene from numerous locations and then can recreate a 3D image of it. Wow. Now, I think in this case, what they're wanting to do, I think what their idea is to be able to just kind of walk around the scene instead of having to set up if it's, you know, there's lots of corners. They had to clean it all up and get it back open to the public. They want to be able to go back in and analyze every little nook and cranny. Yeah. But in the, this specific case, the ZBD, I think they call it, is the little bouncing thing that looks funny. It's the whole idea is to be able to, if you're in an indoor situation, yeah. then, you know, you could walk around an apartment or a house and you don't have to set up the camper in multiple different locations. You can just have somebody walk around and kind of get the information you need in order to recreate it. Huh. Uh, so uh, the video that Heather has embedded in the show notes is really cool. It's worth watching if you're listening on the audio version of this. Definitely. So these are kind of things where. It'll be very useful. I mean, if you have, you know, like I said, automobile accidents, bad weather. I, I kind of want it for my house and then I want to bring it into my computer and then I want to like rearrange my furniture virtually. <laughs> That's what I want it for. Can we just bring that technology yeah. to the consumer? I, <laughs> I've I've played those games like yeah, where you, ha- yeah. you know, have a game you can just pick up and move yeah. furniture and stuff. And I was in my office once and we were trying to rearrange the whole office. And for a split second, my brain thought, I just want to grab this and move it there. I'm like. No, it's not that easy. That's yeah. right. They actually have to move it. Okay, Heather. Now, this next part I'm a little concerned about because it might disconnect us. Now, this is either going to be, I'm not sure, this button either is a spacecraft update or it initiates an emergency saucer separation, uh, which would likely break the transmission since I would be then stuck in the star drive section of the ship. So stand oh, by, no. Heather. Here we go. Oh, oh no. okay, good. Good. It is a spacecraft update. You never know. You never know. I keep moving I, that button around. No matter how many times I tell you to move it to a safe place. Well, I move it next to another crazy button. I just got a lot of crazy I buttons. I know. Yeah, that's what happens. All right. So uh, what do we talk about in the spacecraft update? All right. Opportunity Rover. We've been talking over the last couple of weeks how it had that mystery rock. It appeared out of nowhere. Yeah. And they were taking a picture, 
four days later, they had another picture. Talking about the donut, Lamo. right? Yes, the mm-hmm. jelly donut, they called it. Yeah. Also, Pinnacle Island. Uh, that's its official name. Where oh. suddenly there was a rock <laughs> right there in the middle of nowhere. They went, there wasn't a rock there four days ago. How did that happen? So then went the mystery and the riddle of everything. We go through everything. They finally found out for sure that it was a piece of rock that they had crushed a little higher up on the hill that had rolled down. As sure as they can be without actually having seen it, that's what happened. They were able to, they moved a little bit, drove a little far away, took back, looked at some pictures in order to kind of take a picture of the whole scene about what happened. Mm -hmm. And they showed another rock a little further up the hill that looked very, very similar to the Pinnacle Island, quote, donut. Okay. So they kind of looked at that and they said, okay, that has the exact same, you know, odd appearance. And it was right in the trail of one of their wheels. So I was really most digging- likely happened is they driven, they, uh, they I mean, drug it's 400 it a pounds. Bit, right? Yeah. 185 kilograms. They drove right over it, yeah. crushed that little rock. And then one of them got, you know, sent across the summit and kind of rolled downhill. Oh, okay. 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 So you mean aliens, we haven't just failed to notice them and then all of a sudden they accidentally left a jelly donut in the path of our rover, which turned out. No, the only aliens that crushed that rock and made it fall down the hill are Earth aliens. That's true. We are aliens, aren't we? We are aliens on Mars. (laughs) That's a good point. And they'd actually (laughs) I mean they'd actually pulled in the orbiter, the Mars Reconnaissance orbiter to take a orbital picture of the whole area. Yeah. That's a great picture too. Because they thought, well, there was a really off chance that perhaps there'd been a meteor strike nearby and that it had blown a little chunk of rock that just happened to land near the rover. They doubted it, but check out all avenues. Right. So they looked around about a quarter mile radius, 400 meters, no fresh crater readings. And then they saw this broken rock, so... All right, I'll take it, Heather. I'll take it. I'll okay. believe you. I'll believe you. All right, well, while we're talking about Mars, why don't we do a curiosity update? You ready? Let's go. And lift off of the Atlas V with curiosity. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Okay, so what is our favorite rover up to? All righty. We spoke a couple weeks ago about how the poor wheels are getting some major wear and tear. Yeah. They got all dinged up, a little torn up. So they drove over a little sand dune to kind of get to a smoother patch of area. And they were looking about how to possibly save, you know, save the wheels a little bit more. Right. And hopefully be a little bit easier on them. And they're actually going to drive in reverse. They're going to drive in reverse. Yes. They've actually shown on the, on its twin here on Earth that yes, it's completely feasible. And actually it'll sort of driving over the same terrain it'll use the wear and tear differently sure so you'll kind of save the wheels a little bit of uh of a hard time well it's not like it, it's not like does the does the rover really have a definitive coming and go inside i mean it it seems like you could run uh-huh. that thing in backwards and nobody be the wiser unless they were one of the people that knew what it looked like you know like yeah pretty much yeah i mean i think everything's kind of geared one direction they have you know, uh, an arm for one place. And like uh, Nogal in the chat room says, in one of the Spirit and Opportunity, when they've had problems right. and they had a wheel that broke down, they started driving in reverse. Yep. They're like, okay, we're going to drive in, quote, reverse now. So it happens. Hopefully this will help uh, the wheel, save the wheels a little bit. Okay. So on their way to their next destinations, so they're kind of using the orbiter and their eye on the sky to kind of map out the new smoother area that they'll drive backwards to to get to their next uh, science waypoint. And that reconnaissance orbiter makes a great partner. Oh, yes. So what is the next destination? Uh, The next destination is what they're calling uh, as they're heading towards Mount Sharp. Okay, Mount Sharp. Yeah, that's the mountain where they're heading to. I think their next goal is about a mm, two-thirds of a mile away there's a really interesting part that they're that's our major goal for right now it's where a couple of different uh, rock layers come together Mm. so they 
are planning a route onto that because that's their next major just dis- destination. Well, I'll look forward to an update on that. Why don't uh, we jump in the time machine and uh, head back in time? We got it. We got a short trip this week. Close the door. I yep. don't. I don't want to get z- zapped into the quantum uh, noise. I don't know. What, I don't know what that is out there. Actually, now that I think about it. I don't quite know how this thing works, but I do know that it took us to 48 years ago, March 1st, 1966. Heather, what happened this week in science? Soviet Union's unmanned spacecraft, Venera 3, was partially successful when it reached Venus and automatically released a small landing capsule, hopefully that they thought was going to explore the atmosphere and during a parachute defense uh, descent. Unfortunately, they lost contact with it. Oh. Um, no data returned because of Venus's really harsh atmosphere. We did really didn't understand how acidic, how hot, how much density there was to it. Right. Right. So it took a couple of uh, a couple of probes actually before they could reach the surface of Venus with getting data back. But this specific capsule was the first time that any man-made object had touched the surface of another planet. Whether we got data back from it or not, it was the first object itself that touched another planet. So they mean most likely it was, you know, a failure due to overheat, internal components, solar mm-hmm. panels, all sorts of things like that. But each time they get a little bit of data back that said, okay, this is what we need to build for now. And you can get further and further until they're actually able to get to the surface. I but mean, yeah, this is 1966 after all. Yeah. In 1966, we first plonked Something from man onto another planet. And we chose Venus as our target. That's pretty crazy. Yep. All right, Heather, well, let me recalibrate the side by 2000. That way we can look up into the sky this week. That is right. This week, we're mainly talking about the planets are the exciting thing. Okay. So we got Venus visible before and during dawn in the southeast. It's at its actually brightest point this week. So it's going to be nice and bright out there in the southeast at dawn. Mars rises about 10 p.m. in the southeast also, uh, about 10 p.m. though, with Spica, the blue-white giant star, uh, about six degrees to its right. It's a couple of uh, fingers held at arm's length. Okay. Those are at their highest point at 3 or 4 a.m., Spica now to the lower right. Those are always a nice pair to look at because Venus is sort of, sorry, Mars is sort of orangish red and Spica is blue-white, so they make a nice contrasting color pair. Yeah. We got Jupiter. High in the southeast in the early evenings, crossing nearly overhead for those of us in the mid-northern latitudes, about 8 or 9 p.m., and then setting in the west before dawn. So it's one of those, it's still in the, pretty much you can see it all night long. Aha. Very cool. Saturn raises at early, early 12 to 1 a.m., right about in its highest point, in the south at the beginning of dawn. And then by then it's way far to the left of Mars and Spica. But for the most part, the easiest objects to see are definitely Venus and Jupiter. In the mornings, Venus is in the southeast with Jupiter in the west. And in the evenings, you've got Jupiter in the east. That's a heck of a sky. That is a heck of a sky. And of course, as always, all listed in the show notes. Just go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, look for Cybite 121, scroll down towards the bottom. That's where we're looking up in the sky this week's at, and it's all listed there. It's all there. I mean, you could just bookmark that, and the next time you go to a party, just be super cool and just be like, yeah, so did you know that if we stay up late and party, Saturn will be rising at 12 to 1 a.m.? Rise yeah. around midnight at 1 a.m.? You just say it like that, you sound like all of a sudden you're some kind of expert. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Heather, is there anything else we want to cover this week? Not this week. All right, well, we'd love to hear from you. You can go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click the contact link, and choose SciBite from the drop down or join us live. That's even better on a Tuesday over at jblive.tv. We've got all that over at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar for your local time. Heather, thanks for the great show. Thank you. All right, everyone, well, thank you for tuning in this week's episode of SciBite. I hope we see you right back here next week. 